My name is Mel Mason. I'm Vice Chair of West Midlands Butterfly Conservation, and I'm going to introduce our main guest. We are very, very fortunate to have Dave Gobelson with us today. And I'm really, really looking forward to this talk, as I know many of you are. Let me say just one or two things about Dave. Dave is professor at the School of Life Sciences, University of Sussex. But much, much, much more important than that, he's founder of Bumblebee Conservation. And I'm an enthusiastic member, and I love to watch bees. Now, many of you will know him from his books, and particularly those on bees, and three I would recommend are Sting in the Tail, A Buzz in the Meadow, and Bee Quest. What wonderful titles. If you want to know about bees, these are not just informative, but highly entertaining. He's also written a book called The Garden Jungle on Invertebrates in Our Garden. A brilliant book, a brilliant read. You have to read uh, The Garden Jungle. But his most recent publication is called Silent Earth. And this is very much linked with the theme of his talk, the plight of insects and what we can do to help them. Dave, I'm handing the screen over to you. It's all yours. Thanks, Mel. Uh, thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, I just I should warn you all in advance that uh, I've, I've got COVID at the moment. Thank God this is a remote meeting. But if I collapse in a fit of coughing in the middle of my talk, bear with me. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully that will all be smooth. Uh, there we go. Um, so as you gathered, I, I'm going to be talking more broadly, not just about butterflies, but about insects today. Um, I'll be talking about how kind of amazing and wonderful and incredibly diverse they are. Um, the, the, the importance of insects, which is often um, underappreciated, I think. Um, the evidence that they're declining and, and parts of the middle of the talk are a bit depressing, I warn you now. Um, but I'll then come on to what we can do about it. And there are there is some good news there because there's, there's lots of stuff that we can all get involved in to look after insects, thankfully. Um, and in fact, you've just been hearing about an amazing project doing exactly that. Um, so where do you start? In, insects make up the bulk of life on Earth. There's more than a million known species and, and probably um, three, four, five, six million more that we haven't even named yet, which is which is mind blowing, really, when you think about it. We haven't yet identified the majority of, of creatures on our own planet. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd start at the beginning. Um, with th this is this is a sort of artist's impression of the early world about 480 million years ago, which is when insects first appeared. They were the, the very earliest um, animals to crawl out of the sea and colonize the land and they, they became enormously successful. Uh, they were the first creatures to probably make noises on, on a planet apart from the wind and the waves. It wasn't until crickets or uh, whatever started chirping, singing, buzzing um, that there would have been man-made noises and they were the first creatures to to take to the skies too um, and oxygen concentrations back then were higher than they are today, which enabled insects to grow much bigger than any we have today. And uh, we have fossils of dragonfly-like creatures from uh, the ancient world with a wingspan of about 80 centimeters. Imagine that, that must have been quite a beast. Anyway, so insects basically uh, dominate life on land to this day. Um, th this is basically the planet of the insects in terms of numbers of species, numbers of individuals, um, ants alone outnumber humans by about a million to one. Um, so there's an awful lot of insects out there. And I, I just thought I'd start the talk by just, just showing you some, some examples of insect diversity. So nothing too taxing, just a celebration of the weird and wonderful beasties that are to be found uh, around, around the world. Um, uh, so well, let's start with a weevil. This is the acorn weevil. It's a, it's a British species, rather endearing. I love weevils. Um, they all have this kind of down curved snout. Um, weevils are a type of beetle. And you know, it's a hard, 
almost incredible, but there are 97,000 different species of weevil alone in the world. Who'd have thought it? Um, there's, a, there's a fairly famous quote by a, as an evolutionary biologist called J.B.S. Haldane. He's long dead now, unfortunately. But uh, um, he was asked uh, in an interview what his studies of uh, evolution had taught him about the nature of God. And he was an atheist, so he, his answer was probably facetious, but he said, uh, God, he must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. Um, clearly, he made an awful lot of them, if you believe that's how they came about. Uh, anyway, let's move on quick, more quickly, because I'll be here all day. Some insects are amazingly camouflaged, like this bush cricket. Um, some are astonishingly beautiful and also kind of camouflaged. This is a mantis pretending to be a flower. Um, which serves as camouflage if, as, as in insect eating birds wouldn't think to try and eat it, but it also attracts pollinators for the mantis to eat. There are many insects that are brightly coloured, often because they're toxic, they've sequestered poisons inside them. Um, uh, to, and then they advertise that to, to predators like birds. There are insects that are very good mimics of other insects. This is a British uh, hoverfly species, the bumblebee hoverfly. Um, most people, I think, would think that that was a bumblebee. It's good enough to fool the average human being, let alone uh, birds. If you want to know how to tell them apart, the, probably the biggest clue is that if it was a bee, it would have quite big, long antennae. But uh, anyway, keep an eye out, gorgeous creatures. There are some insects, we have no idea why they look like what they look like. Um, this is a, a, a leaf hopper from Central America, um, which exudes little uh, waxy strands from his bottom that look, make it look like a sort of fiber optic cable or something. Um, nobody has the foggiest idea why it does that. There's even a shield bug in Thailand which uh, seems to be doing an impression of a sort of jaundiced Elvis. Anyway, so <laughs> that was just by way of kind of highlighting how amazingly diverse the insect world is. Um, my speciality are bees. Um, I've been studying bees, I guess, for about 30 years now. Um, now bees are relative latecomers to, to, to the party insect-wise. I mentioned that the first insects date back 480 million years. That's long, long before dinosaurs. The first bees appeared about 120 million years ago, which was pretty much smack in the middle of the age of the dinosaurs, but still before things like T-Rex evolved. Bees evolved from wasps. Um, they're, they're essentially vegan wasps. They, the, the ancestor of the bees was probably, well, it would have been a solitary wasp, probably made a little burrow in the ground and stuffed it full of paralyzed prey and laid its eggs on them. And there are still lots of wasps that do that to this day. But the ancestor of the bees started using pollen to fill its nest instead of paralyzed insects. And uh, so the first bee was born, and that too has proved to be a pretty successful strategy, specialising in feeding on pollen and nectar. And today there are about 25,000 different species of, of bee in the world, and as you can see again, um, very diverse, some of them very colourful. Um, the more spectacular ones on here, I guess, sadly not, not British. The bottom left there, I'd, I've never seen one of those, it's a blue carpenter bee uh, from China. What a magnificent creature that is. Anyway, let me rewind a little bit. Um, so I've been interested in insects um, all my life. I don't know why, just, you know, when I was probably only about six years old, um, one of my earliest memories is of finding the little um, yellow and black caterpillars uh, on the edge of the school playground on some weeds and sticking them in my lunchbox and taking them home. and. Uh, I probably killed most of them, but some of them survived. And, uh, um, and they hatched into these amazing red and black moths. I'm sure you recognize cinnabar moths. Um, I, and I was just hooked. I thought this was kind of magic. Um, and I've been lucky to be able to make a living out of my childhood hobby, I guess. I, I can't believe people still pay me to chase around after insects. Um, Anyway, uh, this of course isn't me. This is this is actually my son Seth. He's my youngest. He's eleven now. This was a couple of years ago. There he is with his pet cockchafer, Colin, um, who's sadly no longer with us. Um, but Seth's very much in his bug phase, and I hope he never grows out of it. But the the sad truth is that most people do. 
Um, most most kids, by the time they're teenagers, by the time they reach adulthood, their reaction to anything that buzzes near them is usually fright. They flap around, they think it's going to bite them or sting them, and they try to kill it, which is really sad. Um, so I guess my my mission in life these days is to try and persuade people to love insects, um, or at the very least, to 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 respect insects because they're incredibly important and they're in trouble and we'll get I'll, I'll talk more about both of those points starting with the trouble they're in so you're all sadly aware um, that insects broadly are in decline I should say the data we have are really really patchy and there are massive knowledge gaps for example we have no long-term data from um, most of the tropics um, where most of the insects probably live um, most of the long-term data sets we have are for specific insect groups and, and fairly narrow geographic regions. And probably the best data set in the, in the world for insects is the British Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, which is, is um, uh, very thorough and has been running since the, the, since the 1970s. Um, and you, you may have seen these graphs before, but uh, um, bit, but, uh, the UK butterflies have been split into the sort of common garden butterflies if you like at the top um, and the, the habitat specialists including the fritillaries and so on at the bottom um, and you can see that they've declined. Um, the most recent paper by Martin Warren and co um, estimates that br broadly butterflies have, are about half as abundant as they were in 1976. Um, now coincidentally my, my son, uh, I, so my, I mentioned my son is 11 I was 11 in 1976, um, so he's growing up in a world where there are half as many butterflies as, as the world I grew up in, um, which, which strikes me as rather sad. It's not just butterflies, of course, that are declining, and it's not just in the UK that this is happening. Uh, one of the, the, the um, most striking examples of insect decline is from a study in Germany. Um, I guess many of you will have heard of it. It was published in 2017. Um, and it's based on malaise trapping. That's a malaise trap top right. It's a sort of tent-like structure that catches all flying insects and most insects fly. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's sampling lots and lots of different species. German entomologists have put these on nature reserves across Germany since the late 1980s and the graph shows you the weight, the biomass of insects caught per trap per day and how it changed between 1989 and 2016 and you can see it fell pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, actually on average it fell by 76% um, which is, is jaw-dropping really. I mean, taken on face value, seemingly three quarters of the insects have disappeared from Germany in, in a pretty short space of, of time. Um, it got a lot of media attention. I, I, I was one of the authors of this study, although I didn't do terribly much for it. Um, uh, but it was covered by newspaper outlets and radio around the world. And it, in fact, I had a slightly odd experience. The, um, uh, I was in a pub uh, near Dorchester and I got a call on my mobile saying um, would uh, from Australia saying there's some Australian radio show wanted to do a live interview with me and in, in 10 minutes time about this study um, and the, the pub I said okay um, I can do that um, uh, and put the phone down and then I thought I need to find somewhere quiet where I can actually hear because the pub had a jukebox playing it was raining really hard outside so I went into the toilets and waited for the call to come through, um, which it duly did. Um, and of course, as soon as the call comes through, some guy wanders into the loo and starts starts urinating rather loudly. And all I could think was, was, oh my God, half of Australia will think it's me that's that's the one urinating. Anyway, um, the the first question that the interviewer asked was, um, so the insects are, are disappearing. That's a good thing, isn't it? Um, which I think was a sort of deliberately provocative um, tongue in cheek kind of question. But nonetheless, uh, I think it does epitomize the attitude of many people that insects are, are more trouble than they're worth, really. Anyway, um, 
So that's Germany. Um, we do have some data from outside Europe, but there's not much. Um, probably the best studied insect um, in terms of population trends outside of Europe is the monarch butterfly, which is uh, monitored in great detail at its overwintering at its hibernation grounds. Now, I, I'm guessing most of you will have heard of this creature. It's an amazing, very iconic, large, colorful butterfly found all over North America. Um, and it's, it's particularly famous um, because it hibernates in huge clusters. In most of them in Mexico, they fly south for the winter uh, and they gather in just a, a few acres of, of forest and cover the trees with butterflies, countless millions of butterflies from all over North America. Um, you may have seen this on David Attenborough has strolled through these forests and it's just the most amazing sight. I'd love, I've never had the chance to go, I'd love to go. Um, and actually the, the, the whole migration of these butterflies is extraordinary. It's, it's sort of summed up in this rather complicated um, map here. Um, but basically, I don't know whether you can see my arrow, but the, that's the, uh, the overwintering ground in Mexico, that orange spot at the bottom. Um, so in the spring, these butterflies uh, fly, wake up and fly north from Mexico into the southern United States and they lay their eggs, they're mainly on milkweed plants um, and um, the, 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 the adults die and the next generation flies further north and they have more offspring and they fly further north until um, by the end of the summer they're right up into Canada. Um, and then when the days start to shorten um, and it starts to cool off, they, they turn around in, in a a single journey as it were butterflies fly all the way from Canada back to Mexico but the really really astonishing thing is that although they're the grandchildren of the butterflies that set out from Mexico that spring they go back to within a few meters of the place where their grandparents left now, how they do that is is one of the sort of great mysteries I guess very cool anyway they are because they gather together every winter in, in, in one place, um, it's fairly easy to, to, to monitor them. There's too many to actually count them individually, but the, the area of forest that they're occupying is uh, recorded fair in, in uh, quite a lot of detail. And you can see here that basically the patch of forest is shrinking, not the, not, not the trees being cut down, but the area covered by the butterflies is shrinking. Uh, it's down by about 80% since the early 1990s. So and it, it, you, don't, you don't have to be a genius to see that if that trend continues, then um, there may not be any monarch butterflies in the United States before too long, um, which would be a, a real tragedy. Now, I mentioned we don't have long-term population data for, for most insects. Um, for, for some though we do have maps and that gives us a different way of looking at how they're doing and I'm just going to give you one more um, example of insect decline I think that's probably enough to thoroughly depress you um, so for wild bees even in the UK we don't really have any long-term population data uh, the bumblebee conservation trust have set up a monitoring scheme um, modeled on the butterfly monitoring scheme but it's fairly early days and um, uh, it's only been running for about 10 years, which isn't really long enough to, to see what the long-term patterns are. But as I said, we can plot distribution maps and that um, gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening. So this is a bumblebee, the, the shrill carder bumblebee, which is a, a gorgeous little bumble called the shrill carder because it has a higher pitched buzz than, uh, than most bumblebees. And with a bit of practice, you can actually kind of pick the, the out, you can hear one before you see them sometimes, if you're lucky enough to find one. Um, it used to be a pretty common bee um, in, in the first half of the 20th century, um, but as time went on, it's, it's rapidly dwindled um, until by about the millennium, it was down to about six kind of population clusters, um, it, broadly in the south of England and Wales. This was about the time I started getting interested in understanding bumblebee population declines. And at the time I was at Southampton University on the South Coast and I looked on the maps and I, I saw that the nearest population I might find was on Salisbury Plain. And I spent a summer 
going up to Salisbury Plain every day and hunting for shrill carders. Uh, fantastic fun, lovely, lovely place if you ever get the chance to, to visit. Um, and I did eventually find some shrill carders. It took me several weeks and I only saw a very small number. Um, but since then, since 2000, um, that population on Salisbury Plain has gone extinct. Um, and the one to the west in the Somerset levels seems to be more or less extinct. There's only been the odd bee seen in, in recent years. So this, this bee is, is disappearing before our eyes. This is not a historical decline. This is something that's still happening on our watch in our lifetime. Um, and just with, as with the monarch, it's, you don't have to extrapolate this very far into the future to predict there may well not be any shrill carders in Britain quite soon. Okay, I'm now going to kind of divert onto something that might seem a little bit strange, but bear with me. Um, I just wanted to tell you about fish, um, Florida fish. Um, there's a really interesting, I think, um, study. It was published by American scientists um, that relates to a, thing, a concept called shifting baselines, uh, our view of the world and how everyone has a different view of the world, depending on when they were brought up. Um, and what they think is normal. Um, anyway, so fish. Um, in Florida, it's quite common for people to go on holiday and they pay to go out for the day in a, a game fishing boat. They have these giant rods and they try and catch the biggest fish they can and they kill them and bring them back and hang them up um, and take a photograph, um, usually with the proud fisherman next to the fish. And um, so the main thrust of this study was they, they got pictures for the same companies have been running um, for many years, right back to the 1950s. Uh, and so they quantified the size of the fish from the photographs as best they could. And you can see straight away that basically there aren't many big fish left in the sea off Florida. I guess they've caught them all. Um, huge fish in 1957, including sharks and whatnot. And relatively tiddly catch in 2007. But that, the fact that fish have got smaller isn't really why I'm telling you about this. What, it was a, there's a throwaway comment towards the end of this paper, which is that the smiles on the faces of the fishermen haven't got any smaller while the fish have got much smaller. So um, the lady bottom right there, um, she looks pretty chuffed with that relatively tiddly fish. If she had any idea that decades earlier she could have expected to catch something a hundred times bigger. She might be quite disappointed, but she doesn't know because in her lifetime, that's what she's become used to. Um, that, by the way, top left is Ernest Hemingway um, with some giant poor fish that he's killed. Um, and so the reason I'm telling you this, you probably twigged, is that I think we are like the lady bottom right. Um, we are, we, we don't realize what we missed. We, we didn't start monitoring wildlife of any sort in any kind of systematic way until the 1960s or 70s. The butterfly data starts in 76. Um, bird data starts in 66. We don't have any quantification of how common things used to be, um, but we have tantalizing glimpses that suggest that our wildlife used to be much, much more common than it is today. And that these declines we've monitored in recent decades are just the tail end of perhaps much bigger declines. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, uh, left there is the silver wash fritillary, um, uh, a glorious uh, species, which I think is still found in the West Midlands in, in small numbers. But it's quite rare in Britain these days. I've never seen many. I, I got really excited a few years ago when I had one in my garden in East Sussex here. But it's, it's one in nine years. Um, uh, but there's a quote from Frederick Frohawk, who was a butterfly um, uh, enthusiast in writing in 1880. Um, and he describes something that I just kind of struggled to, to, to get my head around. So he says the silver wash fritillary was in hordes. They were so common that as the sun touched their overnight resting places, they dropped from the trees like an autumnal shower of falling leaves. It's hard to imagine today, isn't it, seeing anything like that? It sounds like those monarch butterflies. Um, and that suggests to me that silver wash fritillary used to be much, much more common than anything that anyone alive today has ever seen. Similarly, the cowslips there, 
I've got an old recipe, an old uh, wine, homemade wine recipe book um, from, it's published in 1940. And uh, there's a recipe for cowslip wine. Um, and it starts with, um, the, the first instruction is fill two buckets with cowslip petals, um, which I, I don't know many places where you could plausibly do that. And you'd probably be pretty unpopular if you set about collecting every cowslip on your local nature reserve. Um, but presumably in the 1940s, that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I guess cowslips were just that much more common. Anyway, so um, insects have declined. Uh, does it really matter? Um, to go back to the Australian interviewer, um, uh, you know, isn't it a good thing if we lose insects? Aren't they just a, 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 a pain, a trouble? Uh, well, of course, um, they're, well, sometimes they are actually, but uh, more often than not, they're really useful and valuable to us, and that isn't fully appreciated. So I just wanted to run through why insects are useful and important. Um, so they do make up the bulk of life on Earth. They are biodiversity, but then they're food for a, a huge proportion of the things that aren't um, uh, that aren't insects, they're food for lots of species of birds, bats, uh, freshwater fish, amphibians, reptiles, they all depend on, on insects for food. Uh, and so perhaps not surprisingly, we've seen really big declines of insect specialist vertebrates, such as cuckoos and spotted flycatchers, both down really alarmingly uh, since 1966. I remember the spotted flycatcher was, was a common garden bird when I was a teenager. Um, but down 93% since 66. And cuckoos in the lowlands of England have undergone really huge declines. They're doing a bit better in the uplands and in Scotland. Um, but in the lowlands, there are, it's a rare sound to hear a cuckoo these days, sadly. They should, they should be calling now, I guess. Um, and the most likely uh, primary driver of this, of course, is just lack of food. Um, but it's not just uh, as as part of the food chain that insects are important. They do loads of other things too. Their um, biocontrol agents of, of crop pests, admittedly the pests themselves are usually different types of insects, so not all insects are particularly helpful. Um, they're recyclers of all sorts of material, uh, cow pats by dung beetles and dung flies, dead bodies, tree trunks, leaves, you name it, more or less any organic matter is broken down with the help of of insects and they help to keep the soil healthy, they distribute seeds, you name it, they're busy doing it. Um, and most of this is, is these processes, uh, the ma large majority of humans are completely oblivious of. Um, I, I think there's just one thing that insects do for us, which I think most people do recognize these days. And that of course is, is pollination. Um, many people mistakenly think pollination is exclusively done by bees. Um, sometimes I think many people think there's just one species of bee and it pollinates everything. Um, uh, it's a long way from the truth, of course. Um, actually, pollination is done by a, a huge number of different insects. Um, it's estimated just in the UK that maybe 6,000 different insects contribute to pollination, including butterflies and moths, um, lots of different flies, wasps, beetles and so on. And between them, they ensure that our wildflowers set seed. 87% um, of all um, uh, plant species in the world need pollinating by some kind of animal. Um, and in the tropics, it's sometimes a, a, a bird um, or even a bat, but it's usually an insect. And in, in Europe, it's always an insect. Um, and of course, it's not just wildflowers that depend on pollination. Our crops depend on pollination. Um, and we've become used to our supermarkets being kind of replete with this amazing array of fruits and veg from all over the world available 12 months of the year. Um, if we didn't have pollinators, things wouldn't be so good because roughly 75% of the crops we grow need pollination to give a full yield. Um, so without pollinators, we wouldn't have apples, cherries, strawberries, raspberries, pumpkins, tomatoes, chili peppers, you name it, even things like um, coffee and chocolate um, depend upon insect pollination. So uh, life would be pretty tricky without them. And of course, the horrible truth is we couldn't feed everybody um, without pollinators. So we do need to look after them. 
Now I've trotted out these arguments for the sort of utility of insects that, that humans need insects many times. Um, and and of, of course it, I, they're true, but I always find this approach slightly dissatisfying really because it's it's only valuing insects for what they do for us, which does seem a somewhat selfish way of viewing the insect world. And it worries me that there's probably a lot of insects that we don't really need, that we could do without, that they don't do anything ecologically that's absolutely vital. And does that therefore mean that those insects can just go extinct, that we don't care about them? Um, hopefully not. Um, so just to give you an example, this is a rather magnificent beastie, the St. Helena giant earwig, um, which uh, used to live on the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. Uh, it's about three inches long, the biggest earwig that ever lived. Um, but sadly it's gone, um, probably eaten by rats that were accidentally introduced um, on, on boats. Uh, we don't know for sure. But life goes on on St. Helena without a giant earwig. It wasn't necessary. But nonetheless, it seems to me the world is a slightly sadder place for not having a giant earwig, even though none of us were likely to ever go and see one. And I guess more broadly, I, I would argue that, you know, just because we can wipe things out doesn't give us the, the, the right to, or put, put it another way, um, you know, don't we have a kind of moral duty to look after the rest of our kind of fellow creatures on our, our planet? Um, it seems to me we do. Anyway, if we're going to look after insects, we need to know why they're declining. This is a big and complicated subject that, that I can't go into in depth now because there's too much to say. But what's clear is there have been lots of drivers of insect declines and different insects are probably affected more or less by different factors. Um, these are probably the main ones. Um, but you could certainly add more to this list. Loss of habitat and pesticide use are probably two big ones, but there are lots of others. Um, diseases, invasive species, climate change, and so on and so on, uh, which I'm not going to say more about. If you really want to know more, um, uh, read my book, Silent Earth. Um, but I will say a little bit more about the first two. So We've, we've transformed large areas of the planet into things that look like this. Um, I think this is a soybean field in South America, but it doesn't really matter where this photograph was taken. Um, uh, it illustrates my point that there used to be here um, a, a, a native um, ecosystem. There would have been maybe grasslands with flowers and butterflies and, and, and bees and birds, or maybe it was a forest. Um, who knows? It's gone. It's completely scraped away. And all that's left now is, is a biodiversity of one, essentially, the crop. Um, now, of course, we need to feed everybody. Um, but there's no doubt at all that doing it this way is having huge impacts on biodiversity. And I'll come back to that later. Now, an integral kind of part of this kind of farming, this industrial monoculture farming, is a very heavy reliance on chemical inputs. It's hard to farm like this without using lots of chemicals. Um, and pesticide use is undoubtedly one of the contributors to insect declines, not least because many of the pesticides sprayed are insecticides designed to kill insects. Uh, and some of the insecticides available to farmers these days are incredibly poisonous. Um, they're, they're nerve agents that can kill insects in tiny, tiny doses and we're applying millions of tons of pesticides to, to the world every, every year. That said, in, um, in Europe, we should think ourselves relatively lucky because I think Europe for the moment, um, I say for the moment because of course, we're not part of the EU anymore. Um, so I'm slightly hesitant as to what the future will bring. But anyway, um, for the moment, we have probably the best regulated pest pesticide system in the world. It's still um, far from perfect, but it has banned a number of pesticides that are still widely used elsewhere. In other parts of the world, it's common to see things like this, dumping insecticides from aeroplanes, which is spectacularly indiscriminate. Um, very common in, in the Americas. Uh, and, and in the third world, in developing countries, um, it's common to see things like this. Um, so I took this photograph three years ago. Um, 
this is a this is a guy. Um, this was in India, just outside Calcutta. This this is a local farmer. He owns a couple of acres of land, and he grows fruits and vegetables. And he puts them in a basket on the front of his bicycle and cycles them in to city markets. It sounds actually like a really sustainable, um, very low food miles kind of food system. But of course, you can see what he's doing. He's spraying uh, something um, using a really old brass pump sprayer. God knows how many decades old that is. And, and it's, it's with a pipe going into a, a tank slung around his neck. He's got no protective clothing on. He doesn't know anything about the chemical he's spraying. He doesn't even have shoes on, let alone masks and gloves and everything else that he should have. The, the, the chemical he's spraying is paraquat, which is a herbicide. Um, it's banned for use in Europe because it's really dangerous to people. He, he would only have to ingest a drop or two and it would kill him. Um, but the really awful thing is that we still manufacture it. And most of the world's paraquat is made in Huddersfield um, and we ship it all over the world to people like this who, who doesn't know any better. Um, so it's too dangerous for our farmers, but uh, we're quite happy to make a profit by selling it to, to other people. Seems pretty hypocritical to me. Anyway, just to finish off the doom and gloom completely, um, let me just illustrate the scale with which we've managed to, to contaminate the global, in, global environment with pesticides. So this is a map from a Swiss study that um, uh, got members of the public, um, Swiss holidaymakers, to buy a jar of honey when they went away and um, bring it back to Switzerland where the scientists analysed the honey for a type of insecticide called neonicotinoids, um, which have become quite notorious because there's a, there's a lot of evidence that they're partially responsible at least for bee declines and for some other insect declines. Um, so each of the little dots on this map is a, represents a honey sample. And the white ones were free of pesticide. The, uh, the ones that aren't white, which is 75% of them, contained neonicotinoids. So three quarters of the world's honeybees have neurotoxic insecticides in their food stores. And this isn't just of concern to honeybees because those honey, the, the, that contamination is coming from contaminated flowers that the bees are feeding on. And if the honeybees are feeding on contaminated flowers, so will thousands and thousands of other insect species. Um, so we're basically poisoning pollinators around the world on a staggering scale, uh, which is pretty terrifying, I think. Okay, enough doom and gloom. What can we do about all of this? Well, there is good news, finally, thankfully, um, which is that there's lots we can do. Um, unlike many big environmental kind of catastrophes that are unraveling at the moment, which you feel pretty helpless about it. Insect declines, we can all get involved in tackling because they live all around us. Uh, and most of them haven't gone extinct yet. Uh, and given a little bit of encouragement and help, they can recover really fast. You know, insects can breed much more quickly than rhinos or pandas. Um, we just need to give them a bit of space. Um, and there's, there's, there's lots of ways in which we can all get involved and visibly see that what we're doing has helped. So what do we need to do? Well, broadly, there's kind of four areas here. Um, top left, we could make our urban areas, our gardens and whatnot, more wildlife friendly. I'll come back to that in a minute. We need to think about farming and can we make that more, um, more sustainable and more supportive of biodiversity while feeding the world. Um, we really need to put more flowers back, basically. Um, bottom right there is an example of one of the surviving fragments of, of species rich grasslands, uh, hay meadow. Um, in 1930, Britain had 7 million acres of, of species rich grasslands. Um, and by the 1980s, we destroyed 97% of them. It was pretty much that habitat was almost entirely eradicated. And it's a really good habitat for insects. And so not surprisingly, that had quite an impact. But those habitats can be restored. Um, there's some fantastic projects, uh, examples where, where that kind of habitat has been recreated or repaired. Um, with great success. So we, we, you know, we can put it back, we can undo at least some of the damage. 
And we need to stop spraying quite so many pesticides. Uh, and I'll briefly come back to that again too. So firstly, gardening. Um, I think this is a really exciting area where everyone who's lucky enough to have a, a garden or a bit of outdoor space can get involved. There are uh, about 22 million private gardens in the UK covering an area of, it's, a, it's a, about a million acres, 400,000 hectares, which is a bigger area than all of our nature reserves. And just imagine if all of those gardens were, were, were wildlife friendly um, and better still, if we could link them up by persuading the local councils to not mow the verges so much, to, to grow wildflowers in the verges and the roundabouts and the city parks and the cemeteries and every other bit of urban green space we can get hold of then that would be a national network of insect friendly habitat. Um, it wouldn't save everything. There are some insects, including the more fussy specialist butterflies that are never gonna thrive in gardens, but it would certainly be a big step in the right direction. And it's something we can all get involved with. Um, I've written books about this, sorry to plug my own books, but should you be interested in it to know more, uh, you can also check out my YouTube site, which is obviously free, save you buying a book, which has lots of hints and tips for wildlife gardening. It is amazing how diverse gardens can, can be, how many species they can support. Uh, and there's no better illustration of that than the work of a lady called Jenny Owen, who um, lived in Leicester. Uh, she had a small garden of about an eighth of an acre, uh, quite close to the city centre. Um, and what's really remarkable is she spent 35 years cataloguing every species of plant and animal that she could find in her garden while gardening in a kind of wildlife friendly way without pesticides and so on. Um, and her, her species list after 35 years was, if I remember correctly, 2,673 different species of which 1,997 were different types of insects. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I find those numbers quite amazing. I would have thought you might find that many species in a, an eighth of an acre of rainforest, but not in the middle of Leicester. Um, and it just goes to show that we can all have thousands of species living in our back, back gardens. Wouldn't that be amazing? So how do we do that? Um, well, the most obvious thing to do is to, is, or there are a number of things we can do, but most people turn to what plants to grow as the first choice. Um, and particularly, uh, many of us try to provide more flowers for pollinating insects. Um, and there are lots of ways we can in, enhance, increase the number of pollinator friendly flowers in urban areas. Um, starting top left with being a bit more tolerant of what are usually regarded as weeds. Um, gardeners are taught from an early age to, to that certain plants are kind of undesirables. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, dandelions or thistles in your garden, you're a rubbish gardener. Um, so lots of people spend ages digging them out um, or poisoning them with herbicides or whatever. But these are native wildflowers. Um, they're fantastic for, for pollinators, particularly things like dandelions in early spring. Um, really important nectar and uh, pollen source. Um, so if we could just persuade people to be a little bit more tolerant and uh, you know, I mean, I, ideally you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden just like that by renaming them wildflowers because that's basically what they are. Anyway, uh, they're moving around. Um, so my voice is going slightly. Good old COVID. Um, flowering trees, particularly blossom trees, apples, plums, pears, cherries, quinces and so on. Um, if you've got room for flowering trees and you don't need tons of room because you can get them on dwarf rootstocks, then um, they provide this massive glut of food for, for, for insects in the spring, which is fantastic. And if you have room to grow enough different varieties, you can have blossom from late March right through to June, which provides a continuity of food, which is also really important. They're moving around. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Where are we? There we go. Um, bottom right, lawns. You know where I'm going with this. Um, there's a No Mow May campaign on at the moment. I'd, I'd urge everybody to, to take part. You don't have to leave all of your lawn, but try to resist the urge to mow every five minutes. You, we have this strange British obsession with mowing. Um, you know, many people, including my 89 year old dad, still try 
to mow neat straight lines up and down their lawn every fortnight. I, I, I don't really understand why. Um, you can save yourself an awful lot of sweat and petrol by just letting the grass grow, grow a little longer. And if you do, usually it bursts into flower. That uh, here, that's my lawn. Um, and I haven't planted any flowers in it. It's just just what came up. And you can see there's a whole load of white clover, red clover, buttercups, dandelions, self-feel, speedwell. It looks beautiful, I think. Um, uh, so, you know, if we could get everyone to, instead of getting the mower out of the shed, get a deck chair, make yourself a coffee or a gin and tonic and just sit down and relax and enjoy the wildlife. Far more fruitful way to spend your time. And then finally, bottom left there, of course, it's not just gardens that we mow too much. Um, councils typically uh, mow most uh, grassland about eight times a year, uh, just on a sort of knee jerk. It's always been done that way. So we have to carry on doing it um, kind of approach, um, which seems nuts to me. There's a road verge that used to be very boring, mown grass. Um, and it's been planted with wildflowers and it looks amazing. And wouldn't it be fantastic if if, if every road verge uh, around the country looked like that, if every roundabout looked like that, uh, that would be really cool, I think. Instead, what you often see, sadly, is this kind of thing. Um, uh, sorry to just touch back on those pesticides again, but I can't help myself. Um, uh, so top right there um, is a silver birch tree, which had a little bit of vegetation growing around it. Um, probably nothing very exciting, probably mostly grasses, who knows? is dead now, does that really look better than something green and alive? I find it really bizarre that so many, many councils around the country, they employ teams of people to literally drive around the streets looking for something green and killing it. Why, what, what is that all about? Um, and it's, it seems like just completely unnecessary environmental vandalism. There's also a more sinister side to it too, which is that um, the chemical that's used is almost invariably Roundup, which has the active ingredient glyphosate. Um, and there's pretty clear evidence from some big scientific studies that it's a carcinogen, that it causes cancer in humans, and that people most at risk are actually the people who apply it as part of their occupation. So those people touring the streets, spraying um, to kill weeds, uh, seemingly run the risk of getting cancer as a result. Um, and what's worse, um, you can see in the middle and on the left there, it's quite common practice to spray children's play equipment uh, with this same chemical, a carcinogen. Why? That's just bonkers, I would say. Personally, I would ban pesticides completely from urban use. I just don't think we need them. And if you think that sounds a bit radical, I've already done it in France. In 2018, they passed a law uh, which basically uh, meant that unless you're a licensed farmer, you can't buy pesticides in France. Um, uh, so gardeners don't have access to all of these things that we have in our supermarkets and DIY shops and so on. Um, and uh, even the local council can't buy them, they're not allowed to. Uh, so places like Paris is pesticide free. Now, I haven't been there recently, but I haven't heard that Paris has been overrun by giant dandelions or killer cockroaches or anything. So clearly you can manage without these chemicals in urban areas. Uh, and it seems to me that that would be a very sensible way to go. Okay, to finish off, I just wanted to say a couple of words about the bigger and thornier issue of farming. So, We've all, I think, just kind of accepted industrialized farming as the norm. It's a bit like the shifting baselines that I talked about earlier. We've become used to big fields being sprayed over and over again. Um, and and if, if we think about it at all, I think we think it's a necessary evil because we have to feed the world. But I would argue that it's not sustainable, this system of farming, um, for at least three reasons. Um, it's the biggest driver of biodiversity loss on the planet, um, which is undermining its own basis because farming needs pollinators. It needs biocontrol agents, natural enemies of crop pests. It needs soil organisms and so on. Um, so I don't think it, uh, farming will be viable if we carry on uh, as we have. Similarly, 
um, industrial farming is doing huge damage to soil. We're seeing staggering amounts of soil erosion around the world. The United Nations recently produced a report saying that about 40% of the world's soils are now badly degraded. Well, if that carries on, um, what, what are people going to grow food in in the future? Um, we're all going to need soil and it seems that looking after soil should be a top priority. And then finally, food production globally contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we, we all know that we need to somehow rein in climate change. Um, and so again, I don't think we can carry on with the status quo. We need to come up with a, a truly sustainable way of, of feeding everybody that also looks after the environment long term. Um, so I think I don't have all the answers here as to what we should do at all. Um, but I do think it's probably useful to think, OK, what, you know, what would be the ideal farming system or what, what would it give us? What would it do? So obviously it needs to feed us all. Ideally, a healthy diet, which which arguably our current system doesn't do. Um, but it also surely has to look after the soil um, so that future generations have something to grow their food in. And I think it has to work with nature. It has to support pollinated populations. It has to encourage natural enemies uh, to help control crop pests, which really means it, it needs to be a system with much reduced pesticide use or perhaps no pesticide use at all which seems perhaps like a, a tall order. Um, but I think there are some really interesting, uh, innovative um, uh, farming approaches that are already in existence that seem to offer exactly the, all that, that tick all those boxes. Um, so just to give you one example, I haven't got time to talk about all of these. Uh, there's a biodynamic farm near where I live, which I've visited several times, and I was a bit sceptical because there's a little bit of sort of witchcraft involved in biodynamic farming. But actually, almost everything they do is incredibly sensible. They look after the soil. If you dig a hole, it's full of worms. There's loads of insects buzzing about. They don't use any pesticides. They're growing a huge diversity of healthy fruit and veg for sale to the local community from their farm shop. And if you look at the productivity, um, it's actually really high in terms of yield per hectare. So they're doing something right, um, whether there's some magic involved or not. And it seems to me that we could, we should be investing more in these kinds of uh, perhaps slightly alternative approaches to farming. And if we don't, uh, we might end up in big trouble. Whatever we do, we need to do a better job of looking after this. It's, we don't often stop to think about it, but we live on a rock hurtling through space with a crust of life clinging to its surface, mostly types of insect. It's amazing, you know, I mean, there, there really is no planet B. Whatever Elon Musk says, we're not gonna be jetting off to live on Mars anytime soon. It seems utterly mad that we're being so reckless and irresponsible and damaging our own planet, you know, and I, I, I'm always struck by, I mean, we would all do anything for our children, wouldn't we? But a, apart from apparently leave them a decent planet to live on. Um, and I think we, we've got to do better at what better place to start than by looking after all the little insects that live all around us. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with me just about on time. Dave, many, many thanks um, for a, a very, very timely um, and informative and entertaining talk. We've got just a few, well, we've got lots of questions actually coming in now, um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next six minutes. I, I'm going to start with a, um, something I did two weeks ago. I was walking in the Cotswolds um, and um, I came across this great big field of yellow rape and planted in the middle of it was this sign and it said um, this is a conservation area for wildlife. Please take care. I'm not sure what from uh, but it was a very yellow field of rape and it leads on to a question from Andrew Coates. I understand a lot of poisons are used in growing UK oilseed rape. Should we be uh, looking for alternative crops? And is this um, economically sustainable? Yeah, I, I really think one of the key things we should be doing is growing a much greater diversity of crops. If you, you look at the UK landscape, arable farming is almost entirely wheat, barley and oilseed rape. Uh, covers 90 odd percent of, of arable land. Um, 
we're not we're, we import 70 percent of the fruits and vegetables that we eat um so we're overproducing grain and oil and underproducing stuff that's really good for us um it seems to me that it would be sensible to try to diversify as much as possible and and also um you know growing a very small number of crops is is more risky um if anything goes wrong with that crop that year the farmer's in trouble if that's most of his land Whereas if he's growing 20 different crops, he's got a much better chance that something will be thriving each year. Um, so, I mean, yeah, for, for many reasons, I think diversification it would be good, but it really needs support for farmers from government in terms of subsidies and providing them with, with you know, education and training, because most of them are, are used to farming the way they farm and changing is, they may not have the equipment, they may not have the knowledge um, to do it quickly without some help. Um, but yes, basically. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have another question, and this one's from Joy. I'm, I'm ever so sorry if I miss out your questions at all. Um, it says, um, if councils change their mowing regimes, um, the complaints that come into them far outweigh those comments from conservation conservationists who su support them. How do we challenge this and how can we tackle that problem? I think I can guess part of your answer, but I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Um, yeah, I mean, so we're much more likely, I think, to write a letter of complaint than a letter of congratulations, aren't we? It's human nature. Mm. Um, if enough of us wrote letters of thanks and congratulations to the council when we saw an unmown verge full of flowers, uh, and if, if the number of letters like that they got outweighed the number of complaints, then they probably wouldn't cut. They, they are very sensitive to complaints or to, to the weight of opinion expressed in letters. So we need to change that and you know take the time to actually bother to say well done um I, I do think it has changed and you know some councils have really engaged with this and others not so much so far um but it's it's kind of encouraging i think we're we're definitely moving in the right direction it's also an educational thing you know putting a if you're going to leave the verge uncut maybe put up a sign saying wildflower verge uh, so that it's it, it's clear it's an active choice and not just laziness on the part of the council because i think that's what people usually complain about if they if they knew it was being done for positive reasons they'd be less likely to to write a letter i would guess okay thank you um, this one's from jenny um, how do we dispose of old garden pesticides safely don't councils just stick them in a landfill uh, they shouldn't do. If you go to your local recycling centre, um, they have a, they should have a special um, place for putting uh, unwanted pesticides. You just talk to one of the uh, staff, and they'll they usually store them in a shipping container, and I, they should be then disposed of safely. Um, I can't obviously guarantee what happens, but uh, that's the theory. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, this is from Sammy. Council's quote that glyphosate is okay to use on its own. What would be your comment on this? I don't really know what that's meant to mean. I mean, the, 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 um, there's been some big high profile American court cases uh, where people have successfully argued in court that their cancer was caused by occupational exposure to using glyphosate um, on its own. Uh, there were no other chemicals involved. Um, and the payouts have been literally billions of dollars um, so I, I, I'm, the evidence is still disputed, uh, mainly because Monsanto, who make glyphosate, um, have funded lots of science that seems to show that it's harmless. Um, but every independent scientist seems to think it's not. So um, I'm not a cancer specialist, obviously, but it seems to me it would be wise not to use the stuff, um, particularly, you know, in your garden where your kids play, where your pets play and, and so on. Thank you. I mean, I know in reading your book, um, you, you say in one part that um, every field, every crop is treated, I think it was 16 times with either a, a pesticide, a fungicide, or a herbicide, or a combination of them every year, which is yeah. quite frightening. Quite yeah, frightening. The, aver the average in the UK is just over 17 applications per field. Um, and we do have we had data from a, an oilseed rape field which we persuaded the farmer to share with us and including a couple of fertilizers he put 22 applications on including five different types of insecticide just to grow one crop it was astonishing i'm not surprising that our 
you know, wildlife isn't viable in farmland. Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish on one close to your heart, and it's from Kim Edwards. Uh, this spring, we noticed less bees are on our flowering shrubs in a wildlife friendly garden. And this is the positive note. Could the cause be less grass cutting and spraying locally, giving them more choice of other wildflowers and increasing nesting birds taking grubs? Or is it something more sinister? I, I don't know. Let's let's hope it's the positive uh, explanation. Um, I mean, and of course, insect populations do fluctuate a lot in the short term due to the weather. So it's 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 very easy to panic and think all all your bees have disappeared this year or something. But you know, usually the next year they come back um, if your garden is wildlife friendly. So yeah, I, I I wouldn't worry yet. Okay, right. To finish off with, because we're at one o'clock now. I'm getting in comments now, brilliant talk. And I think that's echoed by everyone here that really thumbs up for coming, I can see that there. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today and giving your time over to it. And please, if you haven't read Silent Earth, get it. I'm on my second reading, it's just a joy to read. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Bye everybody, thank you for being with us. Members and non-members, but if you're a non-member, Join Butterfly Conservation and join Bumblebee Conservation as well. <laughs>